Hello there, my friends, and welcome to another brand new lore video. However, if the title didn't give me away, this video is not gonna be about either Warhammer or Battletech lore. You see, for a couple of months now, I have been struggling with a very scary prospect. Namely, what is gonna happen to my channel when all of 40k lore is said and done? Or fully covered, if you will. And every time I reach the same obvious conclusion. Talk about something else. Other game universes or other fantasy settings. And there are a good few selections of those as well, like Diablo or Warcraft or Dune or Star Trek, etc. The main thing I'm scared of though is that most of my audience will actually leave once Warhammer 40k lore starts drying up. Of course, that's not gonna happen immediately, I'm still months and months away from running out of that content. Either way, that issue is something I will expand on more in a future channel update video. I've also thought about covering topics which are not entirely related to gaming or literature. And at the top of that list are mythical creatures. I've always loved learning about mythical creatures and their symbolism. Anything from the Minotaur, to the Cyclops, to the Chupacabra, and beyond. So I figured why not try to make a series about that, since I also care about the topic, and it's also a very rich subject, from which I can make possibly dozens and dozens of episodes. So this video here is gonna be my first attempt at doing that. Please do keep in mind that this is a prototype video, so to speak, so my approach to covering this kind of thing may change in future episodes, if I make any. Now, with the appropriate apologies for a rather lengthy intro, let us learn a few things about our first mythical creature, shall we? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the famous Sphinx. Now, the Sphinx has had a long history of secrecy and intrigue, being viewed by many cultures of the world as the guardians of knowledge and the speaking in riddles. They originate in ancient Egypt. The Sphinx, as a mythical creature, existed in ancient Greece and Mesopotamia, was revered by the later Western world, and to this very day still exists in the Eastern cultures. The Sphinx doesn't have a history of real living existence but exists only in art and literature and architecture. It can represent the human desire for that which is greater than themselves, both in terms of the body and of the mind. Yet the Sphinx also embodies paradox, beautiful and alluring, but also dangerous and deadly. It is a guardian of knowledge and a threat to evil. Encountering a Sphinx is described as both confusing and destructive. Ultimately, it can be said that the Sphinx represents human desire and ability to penetrate the mysteries of the universe, while also being there to warn us that we do venture there at our own risk. Maybe the Sphinx guards against such knowledge until such a time when true human beings, who are worthy and capable of understanding the ultimate truth, actually appear in the world. The Sphinx can vary in its physical features, but it is almost always a composite of two or more animals, and some versions are part human, part animal. In ancient Egypt there were three categories of Sphinx. The so-called Androsphinx, with the body of a lion and the head of a person, the Cryosphinx, with the body of a lion and the head of a ram, and the Hierocosphinx, with the body of a lion and the head of a falcon or a hawk. In Greek mythology, there is a bit less variation, with only one as that of a winged lion with the head of a woman, or the woman with the paws, claws and breasts of a lion, a serpent's tail and the wings of an eagle. They were found throughout history, in tales and in art both. The Sphinx always possesses an enigmatic character though. It is alluring, knowledgeable and dangerous, and it is always to be approached with much, much caution. The Sphinx's most famous attribute is her talent for riddles. She uses her cunning to cook up these riddles, or maybe learn them from someone else. And then she uses them to test the worthiness of men. Anyone failing to answer these riddles is killed and eaten. 
Some legends of the occult describe the so-called four powers of the Sphinx. To know, to will, to dare, and to keep silent. Men and women are encouraged to develop these powers, so they can reach the Chimera's ideal state of wisdom and master the four elements as well. Water, earth, fire and air. In ancient Egypt, the Sphinxes were regarded as iconic images. Usually, they appeared as giant statues with the faces of pharaohs, and almost always were regarded as protectors of the temples or sacred areas. To what extent the Sphinx actually played a role in ancient Egyptian mythology can be an issue of debate. While the Sphinx is not the only combination of man and animal to come out of the ancient religions of the time, it may be one of the first, predating many other anthropomorphic images of animal deities. Famous Egyptian sphinxes include the Alabaster Sphinx of Memphis, located within the open-air museum at that site, and the ram-headed sphinxes, aka the cryosphinxes, representing the god Amon. These can be found in Thebes, of which there were originally some 900 of them. But obviously the most famous and largest of the sphinxes is the Great Sphinx of Giza. This famous Egyptian Sphinx is also known as Sesheps, or the Great Sphinx of Giza, and is situated at the Giza Plateau on the west bank of the River Nile. This thing is a statue with the face of a man and the body of a lion. It is carved out of the surrounding limestone bedrock. It is 57 meters long, or 260 feet. It is 6 meters wide, or 20 feet, with a height of 20 meters or 65 feet. Blocks of stone weighing up to 200 tons were quarried in the construction phase to build the adjoining Sphinx Temple. This is located on the west bank of the Nile River within the confines of the Giza Pyramid Field. The Great Sphinx faces due east, with a small temple between its paws. It was believed to stand as a guardian of the Giza Plateau, facing the rising sun. It was also the focus of solar worship in the Old Kingdom, centered on the adjoining temples built around the time of its probable construction. Its animal form, the lion, was a long-time symbol of the sun in ancient Near Eastern civilizations. Images depicting the Egyptian king in the form of a lion smiting the enemies appear as far back as the early dynastic period of Egypt. The face of the Great Sphinx is believed to be the head of the pharaoh Khafra, or Khefre, often known by the Greek version of the name Khefren, or maybe even that of his brother, the pharaoh Djedefra, which would date its construction back to the 4th dynasty from 2723 BC to 2563 BC. There are other alternative theories which date the Sphinx to a much older time, or even, according to one hypothesis, to prehistoric times. After the Giza necropolis was abandoned, the Sphinx itself became buried up to its shoulders in sand. The first attempt to dig it out dates back to 1400 BC, when the young Tutmosis IV formed an excavation party, which, after some effort, managed to dig up the front paws. Tutmosis IV also had a granite stella, known as the Dream Stella, placed between its paws. That stella reads, in part, and I quote, The royal son, Totmos, being arrived while walking at midday and seating himself under the shadow of this mighty god, was overcome by slumber and slept at the very moment when Ra is at a summit. He found that the majesty of this august god spoke to him with his own mouth as a father speaks to his son, saying, Look upon me, contemplate me, O my son Tatmos. I am thy father, Harmakis Kopri Ra Tum. I bestow upon thee the sovereignty over my domain, the supremacy over the living. Behold my actual condition, that thou mayest protect all my perfect limbs. The sand of the desert where I am laid has covered me. Save me causing all that is in my heart to be executed. The pharaoh Ramses II may have also performed restoration work on the Sphinx. However, it was not until 1817 that the first modern dig, undertaken by Giovanni Battista Caviglia, uncovered the chest of the Sphinx completely. 
The entirety of the thing was finally dug out in 1925. While it is more than likely that the Greeks acquired the idea of the Sphinx through cultural diffusion, they nevertheless incorporated it to a large degree into their written mythology and gave it its name, which is a potential combination of the Greek verb sphingo, which means to strangle, and the name Phyx or Pyx. The most famous legend of the Greek Sphinx is her reign of terror on the Greek city of Thebes. You see, there was pretty much just one famous Sphinx in Greek mythology. A unique demon of destruction and bad luck. According to Hesiod, a daughter of Echidna and Orphrus. Or according to someone else, a daughter of Typhon and Echidna. She was represented in vase paintings and bas reliefs, most often seated upright rather than recumbent. Once upon a time, several gods were very angry with the people of Thebes. Maybe Hera, Ares, Dionysus, or Hades all had some kind of reason to seek revenge against the city. So it's not clear which one of these raffle gods decided to summon the Sphinx from her supposed home in Africa, and set her loose upon Thebes. She was instructed to act as a plague upon the people, but instead of running amok in the streets and causing mass carnage, the creature decided to perch herself upon the top of Mount Phicion and challenge everyone who wanted to enter the city to a riddle. There are multiple variants of this riddle, but the most common one is What has one voice but four feet, then two feet, and then three feet? The solution to the riddle, which supposedly the Sphinx learned from the Nine Muses, is simply man. You see, as a baby, man crawls on four feet, as an adult he walks on two feet, and as an elder he has a cane and thus uses three feet. Another riddle was, there are two sisters, one gives birth to another, who in turn gives birth to the first. Who are they? The solution to that one, which the Sphinx supposedly learned from the Oracle of Cadmus, is night and day. An oracle told the Thebans that they would finally be free of the dreaded Sphinx only when the riddle is answered. So they held convention after convention, trying to come up with an answer. But all the answers they tried were incorrect, and the monster devoured all the men who answered incorrectly. After losing many of the best men in Thebes, the king of Thebes surrendered. He declared that anyone who could answer the Sphinx's riddle would become king of Thebes instead. A man named Oedipus answered the offer. He climbed up to Mount Phicion by himself to face the murderous monster, and he finally answered the riddle correctly. Some versions of the story explain that Oedipus knew the answer because it was given to him in a dream. Another version claims that the Sphinx was bored of massacring the people of Thebes, and she told Oedipus the answer. When the riddle was finally solved, the monster leapt from Mount Phicion and fell to her death below. In contrast to the Sphinx in Egypt, Mesopotamia, or Greece, where the traditions have largely been lost due to the discontinuity of civilization, the traditions of the Asian Sphinx are still very much alive. The Sphinxes from Mathura, Kausambi, or Sanchi, dated to the 3rd century BC until the 1st century AD, show a considerable non-Hellenist indigenous character. It is therefore unlikely that the concept of the Sphinx actually originated via foreign influence. In South India, the Sphinx is known as Purushamriga, or Purushamirukam, which means human beast in Tamil. It is found depicted in sculptures in temples and palaces, where it serves an apotropaic purpose to ward off evil, just like other Sphinxes in other parts of the world. According to local tradition, it is said that they take away the sins of the devotees when they enter a temple and to ward off evil in general. It is often found in a strategic position at the temple gateway, or near the entrance to the Sanctum Sanctorum. The Purushamriga plays a significant role in daily as well as yearly rituals of South Indian Shaiva temples. In the so-called Sodasa Upakara, or 16 Honors ritual, it is performed between 1 to 6 times during the day, and it decorates one of the lamps of the 
Diparadana or Lamp Ceremony. In the Kanyakumari district, on the southeastern tip of the Indian subcontinent, during the night of the Shiva Ratri, devotees supposedly run 75 kilometers while visiting and worshipping at 12 temples of Shiva. This so-called Shiva Otam, or the run for Shiva, is performed in commemoration of the story of the race between the Sphinx and Bhima, one of the heroes of the epic Mahabharata. In Sri Lanka, the Sphinx is known as Narasimha, or Man Lion. It has the body of a lion and the head of a human, and it is not to be confused with the Narasimha, which is the fourth reincarnation of the deity Mahavishnu. The Sphinx Narasimha is part of the Buddhist tradition and functions as a guardian of the northern direction and was also depicted on banners. In Myanmar, the Sphinx is known as Manusiha or Manufiha. Its legends tell how it was created by Buddhist monks to protect a newborn royal baby from being devoured by she ogres. Nora Nair and Tep Nora Singh are two of the names under which the Sphinx is known in Thailand. They are depicted as upright walking creatures with the lower body of a lion or a deer and the upper body of a human. These are often found in twos, as a pair of male and female. Here, too, they also serve a protective function. They are also enumerated among the mythological creatures inhabiting the range of the sacred mountain known as Himapan. Despite all these variations of the Sphinx archetype across the world, not all human-headed animals of antiquity are Sphinxes. In ancient Assyria, for example, Bas-reliefs of bulls with the crowned bearded heads of the kings used to guard the entrances to their temples. In the classical Olympian mythology of Greece, all the deities had human form, though they could also assume their animal natures as well. All the creatures of ancient Greek myth that combine human and animal form are the survivals of the pre-Olympian religion. Things like the centaurs, the medusa, the lamia, etc. Nowadays, the Egyptian pyramids and the Sphinx of Giza have become quite inseparable icons. This weathered monument is one of the greatest icons of Egypt. It can be found on coins, on stamps, and even on official documents. Beyond the monuments of Egypt, the Sphinx has been depicted in art for many centuries. Some of the more famous depictions, ranging from ancient Greece all the way to Asia, are variations of Oedipus' encounter with the monster. Some depictions show a sphinx in a position of power and wisdom, looking down on Oedipus as he tries to solve the riddle, while others are depicting the battle of the minds as an epic mortal fight. In any case, the artistic iconography of the Greek legend represents man's ability to penetrate the mysteries of the world, and, for once, to use the mind rather than the fist to solve a tricky problem. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the mythological creature known as the Sphinx for today. Now, one thing I would like to get out of the way is that I'm not any authority on mythical creatures. At least not in the same way I am with Warhammer, where I did read dozens and dozens of novels on the topic. But... Like I said in the beginning, it is a topic that I find very interesting and I am drawn to it. And I will do my best to adapt the information I find into hopefully a comprehensible and maybe even entertaining format. I have no idea when or even if I will make another video like this. The main factor is, obviously, how many views it gets. But if it gets at least comparable numbers to my average 40k video, I will do my best to make it a weekly series. Was this episode informative or entertaining? In that case, please consider clicking the like button and subscribing for future content. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all an awesome day. This is GDN signing out.